Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome to Books on the Basis Week 2024. This is organized by the ISKCON Ministry of Education. And uh, we come together here to talk about the importance of reading Srila Prabhupada's books. And today we'll do that from the perspective of the youth. And I'm very happy to introduce our special guest for this session. We have with us His Holiness Swayam Bhagavan Keshav Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you so much for joining us. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much for having me. Really happy to be here with uh, all of you. Hare Krishna. Yeah, Maharaj um, is a very dynamic preacher, traveler, and the author of several books. And Maharaj has served for over 20 years at the Bhaktivedanta Manor. He's developed many different uh, programs, such as the Bhakti School, and has a lot of experience to preaching to the youth. And, and also, I think Maharaj received uh, sannyas from his spiritual master, his son as um, Maharaj, in the summer of 2022, and since then even more travels and preaches. I think Maharaj is known for his uh, ability to present ancient wisdom in a re very relevant way for today's world. So thank you for being with us. Then we have uh, His Grace Manoram Prabhu with us, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Well, Manoram Prabhu is a senior devotee and has been serving for many years, I think more than 30, almost 30 years now, as the minister of the um, ISKCON Ministry of Youth, the Youth Ministry, together with his wife, Chai Sri Radhe Madhuchi. And uh, I personally feel that, you know, like a in a very dynamic way, a very active minister has developed many different programs. And one of the famous ones is the bus tour, traveling with youth throughout across the US and since a couple of years also in Europe. And in this way, in inspiring, encouraging many, many young devotees to take up Krishna consciousness serious and be active in the mini mini uh, ministry uh, activities. And at his home in uh, Alachua, Florida, probably also runs a like weekly Bhagavad Gita study group for the local youth. So a lot of experience with working the youth. So thank you so much for joining. Happy to be here. Humbled to be here. <laughs> it's, our thank you. it's our good fortune to have your association. And then last but not least, we have Malini Madachi from Sweden. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's very nice to have you also with us. Uh, we, we felt we want to have a young devotee also on the panel. And Malini also herself, she has worked with views for 10 years and has you know, done drama and work with, with young people and uh, lives in the south of Sweden. And she's also the daughter of the legendary Manidar Prabhu, book distributor and Prabhu disciple. Some of you may know him. So it's wonderful to have you know next generation of devotees uh, also concerned about the importance of reading, studying Prabhupada's books. So thank you for joining Thank you so much. I'm also just very glad to be here and excited to talk about this topic. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a very important topic, and um, I think there's much to say about it. And today, I especially, focus on on the youth. So let's see. Um, maybe we can start with the very basic questions of um, yeah, why is it important for the youth of in ISKCON to study to Prabhupada's books? What What's the importance of that? Who likes to start? You're going to have to call on people. That's what happens in youth groups. <laughs> Pick up unless you call on them. Yeah, I would say, Manoram Prabhu, you're the most uh, senior. In our well, group. one of the thoughts that I have is that youth are the future of our movement. So if they you know, have to carry on the mission, they need to know what it's all about and, and are the you know, so they need to learn the philosophy, and that's within Srila Prabhupada's books. So it's very important for us to, you know, take the time to inspire them to study the books. Thank you. Uh, it rem reminds me of a purport by Srila Prabhupada about uh, the Ajamil story where Prabhupada says the messengers of a master need to know the mission of their master. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the youth are the future of ISKCON. And if they don't know what's proper mood and mission and, and what's right. all about, who will know? You know, like, yeah, very important point. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, there's this famous story where someone, I think he asked Prabhupada, like, why is everyone in your movement so young? And Prabhupada said something to the effect of, you know, like, why is everyone in the school so young? And Prabhupada kind of sort of rhetorical question. And then Prabhupada said, because youth is the best time to learn. And that's when you learn. And it's almost like, you know, when you're young, you have your whole life ahead of you, like have all these decisions you have to make. You have to decide like where you're going to live, what you're going to work as, who you're going to marry, how you're going to live. And it's almost like by reading Prabhupada's books, you kind of get that big why, like clear in your mind, like this is what life is about. And when you have that why, then the how and the what and you know all of those answers to those questions become i wouldn't say easy but easier maybe because you have a sense of like where i'm going in my life and and so it's like it's really strange because there's this whole thing that people think religion is something you do when you're old when you're close to death and when you're because they always think of it as something for the afterlife but like from my experience whatever little experience I have it's just helped me so much in the here life like making decisions navigating complexity and all of that stuff so it's almost like yeah probably just books just equip you for life like I guess that's one way you could yeah yeah Pauline you like to yeah I don't (laughs) well I agree with um, all of these points and When I was thinking about this, I was thinking that the books, they are the basis. I mean, that's what they tell us what to do and why we do it again, the why. Um, And it's also the foundation of our spiritual practice, because if we don't, if we're not equipped with the knowledge, then when life throws something at us, it does become more difficult to deal with it. And also... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like when you, it's like when you're building a house, you need a strong foundation. And I find sometimes with the youth, they, they want to jump straight to the the good stuff, the, the, the kind of the basics and the philosophy is not always that fun, maybe, but it's it's what builds the stability, the simple things of of uh, what what Prabhupada starts with. And we need to we need to start. We need to learn from the beginning. So I think that's important for any for anybody. But it's nice when it happens from the youth in the beginning. Mm-hmm. All right, so I hear the, the basis that needs to be, foundation that needs to be laid, and also the why. Because young people, they do ask, you know, okay, what what will life bring? And Robert's books can give a certain sense of direction, yeah. yeah. And Marlene, uh, Marlene, you just mentioned that, you know, sometimes youth maybe, they are kind of attracted towards that, which gives fun, you know. Mm. Maybe daddy is not exactly that, which seems to be so attractive. Mm. Kirtan, for example, is a very big, you know, like, I mean, everyone likes Kirtan. Mm. Uh, so how do you think, like, this this ancient knowledge, it's thousands of years old, how is it relevant for the, for young people today? So how, how do we communicate the relevance of the scriptures for the youth of today? What, what could be ideas to do so? And... Uh, you can either just go around the circle <laughs> or you can also spontaneously jump in if you have some. Mm. Well, I think if you look at a lot of the um, the things which are trending in the world today, like which are, which are really on people's minds, um, you know, stuff like purpose has become such a big thing in the world. Um, relationships has always been a huge thing. Um, kind of navigating change and resilience and kind of it's a very volatile uh, kind of constantly evolving world that we're living in so if you kind of look at all of these things that the human experience of what people go through in this world um, it's so it, 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 it's so much addressed within our scriptures you know and and so I think a lot of it is just that, you know, we always talk about how the scriptures are timeless and how the things that they talk about 
um, are things that people go through in their hearts and their minds and their lives in all times, places and circumstances. I think the challenge is just really how to reach people with the right type of language and how to break down the scriptures so that people really feel like this is helping me in my life. Um, I think sometimes scriptures have just been seen to be philosophically very lofty or very otherworldly or just almost so disconnected from like my life tomorrow that um, people just tend, tend to like, like neglect them or not explore them as seriously. Mm. Um, it's kind of interesting even now, I think, I think a lot of devotees in our movement, they read a lot of self-development books, <laughs> which is, well, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Maybe it also helps them, you know, and, and they need practical help. But it would be nice if we could also see that a lot of that is already within our scriptures and it's just a matter of mining it, you know. Um, so yeah. those are just some of my thoughts. <laughs> Understanding the Bhagavad Gita to be the original self-help book, I think that that's one of the approaches that Marish you also present in your seminars. Yeah, mm. yeah. On the wrong, Prabhu. I'd like to add something. In our, in our weekly youth Bhagavad Gita study group, this is a big topic. You know, obviously, if it's not relevant to them, they won't pay attention. So we try to really, you know. Whatever we read together, we try to find the points that are relevant in their young lives. And one thing that I've noticed and picked up on is that they don't want to be embarrassed in school by friends asking them, what is it all about? What do you believe in? What's a Hare Krishna? You know, And they have no answers because they haven't studied the philosophy. <laughs> so that's a big motivating factor for them to come to Bhagavad Gita study. And they're, they're asking all the questions that they get asked in school. You know, professor asks them or their friends might ask. Like, how do I respond to this person? What do I tell them? You know, so okay, well, let's look this up. You know, let's look at you know what the Bhagavad Gita says. Oh, I find that interesting that that they feel like, well, I'm a Hare Krishna. I grew up like that, and it's right. my my belief. But then, how do I communicate that to the outside world? Because people do ask. And yeah, yeah. the other thought that I had is that there is a famous uh, Bible that's distributed in every hotel room in North America by the Gideon Society. And at the front, they have an index to try to make the Bible relevant to everyday persons. And it oh. says, if you're depressed, read this section. If you're curious about such and such, read this section, right? So that would be an interesting thing to develop because it's like a thematic approach, right? The scriptures have so many answers to so many things, but where do, where do I go? You know, where, which page do I turn to? Hmm. Sorry yeah. to jump in just on that, Manoram Prabhu. We did actually do something with that, with the BBT, mm. the North European BBT. So I don't know, like, if you look in the new versions of the Gita, we have something in the front called Answers from the Gita. Okay. And what we did, is we came up with about 30 questions, you know, like, why do bad things happen to good people? Right. Oh. What happens when they die? Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, uh, what is karma? Um, and then we gave a, um, we we actually gave a, uh, yeah, like a reference for it. So yeah, we kind of took that idea because that that is really that's fascinating for people if they just want to get an immediate answer or an immediate bit of wisdom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mali, Mali, how do you make? How do you? How how do we keep it relevant for the youth? Yeah. Well, it's an interesting point that you made this about going to school and having to kind of inadvertently become a preacher, even without asking for it, just being, especially if you grew up like me in the 90s and just being a vegetarian, that was a whole topic on its own. And then describing that, yeah, I'm a Hare Krishna. What on earth does that mean? <laughs> um, and just trying to kind of piece it together from what you what you hear as a child. Um but I also think that's why it's so important to engage the youth in reading Srila Prabhupada's books, because those gaps of knowledge, it, um, it, uh, it's, it's sometimes difficult to deal with because um, oh, well, I know at least with my group, with, um, with some of uh, the young girls in my group that I remember <laughs> just recently, um, one of them finding out that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was here 500 years ago and her eyes just exploded. She, and she's, she's second generation. She's born in the movement. And she thought, that's so 
I mean, that's so recent. I said, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? So, um, so it's so nice to see kind of those gaps then getting filled and kind of them expanding this um, uh, experience of being in Krishna consciousness. And I think the point of engaging the youth first and foremost is to do it with enthusiasm and to to do it with not with the idea of like, hey, you've been missing out. You should have been studying this. I I really don't believe I'm allergic to that approach from my personal experience and for doing it for others as well. So to really approach it with enthusiasm. And then I think it's really important for yourself then to be enthusiastic because how can you give something that you don't have? The person mm -hmm. who's trying to engage the youth has to be themselves interested in Srila Prabhupada's books and genuinely enjoy it because they can feel that. I mean, everybody, but especially kids and young people. Like if you're insincere or putting on a show, they can feel it immediately and they're not interested in it. So that I feel like is the number one key point to be enthusiastic, to really involve instead of, or engage rather than teach or mm. lecture. So engagement, I would say. It's like, like really sharing that higher taste and, and yeah, and they, they, they want to do it from by themselves. It's not forced yeah. On them. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, very good point. Very important. Yeah, in preparing for this uh, Zoom call, I asked a few youth leaders around the world to give me some suggestions, and many of them mentioned this point. Mm -hmm. You have to have an enthusiastic mentor, right, who mm -hmm. brings the scriptures to life and can make it relevant for the kids, for the young people. Um, you know, we talk about this concept of the person Bhagavat, right? The devotee has to exemplify it. And if you have a, a person who's just super enthusiastic, one of the persons I asked was by Sheshika Prabhu. Mm. He gave me some ideas of what he did with his youth group there in Silicon Valley. And I said, uh, you know, by Sheshika Prabhu, it really helps to have somebody like you who's super inspired and just like flowing with enthusiasm, right? When you're talking about Shil Prabhupada's books. So if the teacher is enthusiastic, naturally the students will be, you know, they'll pick up on that mood. Absolutely. <laughs> and then it's so nice for them because when they have that information, they can then relay it, um, relate it to the current events in the world, because that's what I think is so important, is we want to be able to relate to it. We want that that we can live this philosophy rather than just reading about it or thinking about it. And I think that's why it's really important to discuss it with the youth, because I think in some ways the world can be more confusing than ever right now. And, um, and to really have that space, open space for discussing all topics and then kind of trying to approach it from the scriptures and you know, open and safe safe space where they can ask all kinds of challenging difficult questions that they may not feel comfortable to ask in the traditional temple bhagavatam class exactly they have all kinds of questions once you get into it, it's like but why but why yeah. why should we believe this you know yeah but they don't feel comfortable in you know they have to have some relationship and some friendship with the person they're discussing this with yeah, I think that brings us to the next question. So how, how do you engage youth in reading Prabhupada's books? And you just mentioned that we have the traditional Srimad Bhagavatam class in the temple room. But yeah, that might not be the exact perfect setting for some. And there might be other ways to do it. Of course, there's reading groups and things, but maybe we can explore a little bit. I think, Manoro Prabhu, you, you mentioned that you have the Bhagavad Gita reading. You have like a reading group. You come together yeah. in person or virtually on no, it's in person at our house, at my house. Uh, my wife cooks really good prashadam, which I think draws a lot of young people. Yeah, and you and can't the parents, the parents bring the youth and drop them off because they know on Wednesday nights they don't have to cook. Um, <laughs> and it's, you know, you, you know, surprise, you may be surprised to find out that most people don't come for the philosophy. They come for the sangha and the friendship because all their friends are going. And that's one of the key things, I think, to getting teenagers or, you know, people of that age who are growing up in the movement to study the books, is you have to do it with a group of friends in a safe environment that's not necessarily the temple room, um, where they don't feel judged by senior devotees, you know, like if they say the wrong thing or they ask the wrong question. And 
just, you know, we, we sit together in a circle. It's not a Bhagavatam class format. We sit together in a circle and we take turns reading sections and then we discuss and we try to find the relevant points. So how is this relevant in our lives? You know, how does this apply? And they ask a ton of questions, you know, so you just have to be prepared. But why does Brahma have four heads? But why? But why? <laughs> you better prepare if you're going to be the, the facilitator. <clears throat> Yeah, that sounds very like a familiar, like a very personal approach, which is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's so important to get the balance between, um, you know, oftentimes there's this kind of notion that you're not allowed to question, that if you question or if you doubt, then you're in some way, you know, being offensive almost, you know. And then there's the whole other side where it becomes like you just begin to question everything and it just it becomes almost like unhealthy as well. And it's like just creating an atmosphere where there can be that balance, questioning, that openness, but it's also progressive. People learn things. Um, and one thing I've seen with youth is that when you do create that atmosphere, they there is a lot that they've actually thought about. Um, sometimes a lot that even may disturb them. Um, that they want to talk about, but they don't know where to talk about it. And uh, and I think just them being able to voice their questions, even if sometimes we don't come to a concrete answer, or just the fact that they were able to talk about it in itself is like very um, progressive. So, yeah, that's... I think there's a there's a lot in our books which uh, which people question, you know, especially this the, the the generation at the moment, and you know, like everything is everything is under scrutiny, you know, and uh, it's so important to have that opportunity to discuss that, you know. Hmm. Hmm. Otherwise, people end up kind of following Shila Prabhupada out of kind of like. Okay, well, that's what we do in the Hare Krishna movement. We follow Srila Prabhupada. That's what we're meant to do. Um, but there's a, still a reservation in the heart. Like, do I really resonate like fully with this? And how do we bring out that spontaneous appreciation that no, actually Srila Prabhupada is amazing and I want to, you know, I want to follow him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Malini, you, you also have a having reading groups in Sweden? Yes, yes, we have. Um, we've uh, started a study group called Prima Sangha, which is, uh, um, we, it's kind of like an introduction course that we do for like the beginning of Krishna consciousness, the ABCs. And and yeah, so we, we learn, we discuss, and, but there's a big um, emphasis also on building, um, strong friendships and bonds within the group itself so for every session we have um we have these check-ins where we check in with each other seeing how are you doing and also having the space for everyone to just catch up because a lot of us we don't live in the same place so we sometimes have these meetings online as well and and i think that that point that manoram was saying of that you have to do it with friends and that changes the experience a lot. Um, so that's why reading together, discussing together, encouraging each other or sharing what we have read in our own time, it it's so much, it's it's a lot more effective than if you just do it alone, what I've seen, at least in my experience. And yeah, and also that to kind of emphasize for the youth that it's not some obscure um, scripture, but that Krishna is talking to us personally. I've, I've that's something I've tried to emphasize a lot with the youth as well. Um, that He is talking to you and me personally, and that that was that was a big moment for me in my reading journey when I was rereading the Gita, and I, for the first time, I felt like, oh, okay, Krishna is talking to me. Like, yes, it's Arjuna, um, but it's also that invitation of that we're learning from krishna and the the process is actually quite personal so yeah so but we we try to focus on that as well as that caring about each other as people as friends and then yeah learning together 
All right, so we, we spoke a little bit about the importance of reading and also some ways to engage youth. So what about the challenges? I mean, what are what are common challenges encountered when introducing youth to reading Prabhupada's books? Maybe you can talk a little bit up about this. Um, I guess there would be many challenges that <laughs> could come up, right? I think one thing is just like, generally, it's an age where people don't read as much. Um, yeah, just in general, know, that's already something which kind of, yeah. yeah. People's attention is like really short and people tend to be consumers of like online, short, sharp, you know, kind of very stimulating content, um, at least immediately to their senses. So like, it's becoming harder and harder for people just to sit down and just be in that space, be in that quiet. Um, I think, and, and, and just also, I think another thing is um, that now people just want to get the essence in a very kind of, palatable and a very easy way so people are like they so like sometimes that reflects in like for, say for example rather than reading through the whole bhagavatam i can just listen to a lecture and kind of just get everything i need to get you know um, without having to go through the whole process or i can just read another book which is just kind of easier for me to read which just summarizes it really quickly and then so we tend to want to kind of um, take the shortcuts rather than going through the whole process. But that process of just sitting down with Prabhupada's books and just going line by line is so purifying. Um, but yeah, I think we just live in a time where we just want a shortcut to like, what's the bottom line? What's the essence? And that patience is maybe not there. Yeah, we live in an in instant that you want immediately something, no? You, no. A gut reaction is it's boring. You know that you get from young people. It's boring. They they stay for the kirtan, but get up and leave during Bhagavatam class or or the Sunday feast lecture. You know, in general, if you observe our young people. So to to counteract the it's boring notion. That's the big challenge, I think, for me and for other people, to really make it interactive, participatory, welcome their input, ask lots of questions, you know, call on them because they won't always speak up. They're young, they're a little embarrassed to say the wrong thing in front of their friends even. So I literally have to go around the room and call on them and say, so what do you think? And what do you think? And just engage them, right? Try to really go out of my way to make it relevant and lively, you know, the discussion. Because you don't want them going home to their parents and say, oh, the Bhagavad Gita study group with Manorama Jairada is boring. I don't want to go anymore, right? <laughs> so that's the challenge in real world terms, yeah. for me anyway. Mm -hmm. And yes, I agree, you know, the distractions. We definitely have them uh, give us their cell phones at the beginning of the program so they're not constantly distracted by their phones yeah. while we're trying to have a discussion. Yeah. Malini, what are the Swedish challenges? <laughs> well, I feel I've been quite lucky in that for some, like, well, the the young boys in our community, they're so fired up. They're on, they're on already on Sankirtan trips around the world, and with the girls, I I see that they they have a natural inclination. I mean, when we go on, when we visit different temples and everything, they do show up to class, so they kind of have a natural inclination, which I'm very grateful for the the challenge that or sort of um a little bit of a struggle that we've faced is a lack of vocabulary or lack of english vocabulary um when they're reading the books is that most often i won't get questions about concepts or big and big uh, topics in in the books it will be about words it will be malini what does the word suffice mean <laughs> what does plenary portions mean and sometimes I have to be like, oh, I have a feeling I understand what that means, but I don't actually know the the definition. So, um, 
yeah, because I mean, it's a global thing. I, I read in a study recently that in America, among the most educated population, that the vocabulary has gone down 12.5% um, over the past half century, which is a little bit <laughs> frightening. Um, so, and I think that is because of the rise of audiovisual media is that everything is a lot more quick and casual, like the language is more casual. It's not as refined or classic in that sense, um, because Prabhupada uses very, very nice language. I feel like when you do read the books, you, your, your language gets better also because of um, how he expresses himself. So, yeah, and I, in a way, I find it's almost important to engage the youth to read more in general, just to kind of expand their mind, expand the practice of reading. Because in the beginning, when you start reading after one page, you're tired also, they just fall asleep. They're just like, oh my gosh, this is too much. Um, to kind of build some stamina and, um, yeah, to get used to the experience of reading. I would like to give a tiny example because um, it's a really, I find myself, I find it a bit funny that I'm in this conversation today because I used to be a person who did not read anything. I did not like to read um, at all. And then I felt if I should read, then it should be Prabhupada's books because that's what should be read. And yeah, especially when you're a second generation. But again, it was the same thing. It was boring. I didn't understand it. Half the words just went straight over my head. And um, I got so frustrated that at the end I was like, okay, I have to take a break. Um, and this is being a young teenager. And then I started reading what I wanted, um, kind of all kinds of books. Um, and, and so it was practice for me and I kind of trained my imagination and I expanded my vocabulary. And then when I came back to Srila Prabhupada's books, it was like a world had opened up for me. Like I could see it, I could hear it, I could feel it, and I could understand like at least the, the vocabulary better. And it came to life and I could, and I started laughing when I was reading. I cried, I mean, and it would be deep and moving because these books, they have everything in them and they're told in such a beautiful and engaging way that I sometimes feel it's, it's also just about having a bit of the right tools going into it instead of feeling like I can't do this, I don't understand it or anything like that. So yeah, I feel um, to make the, the books vivid, it's such a powerful experience then when you read them, it's so alive. So yeah, that's just a bit of a... Rajesh Prabhu shared that he likes to read relevant sections of the Bhagavatam on appearance days and festival days and whatever with his youth. Because then they realize, wow, all those stories are in the Bhagavatam, you know, mm -hmm. in a Shringade pastime, you know, Lord Ramachandra pastime, etc. right? So he reads with them, you know, those sections. Because sometimes, you know, I didn't realize until, you know, my mid-30s, everything that was in the Bhagavatam. And when I started discovering, oh, astronomy? fifth canto, you know, or whatever my interests were at the time, right? There's so much in there and 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 kids don't realize it. Or, you know, somebody mentioned to me, well, the kids really like Mahabharat. The first canto continues where Mahabharat leaves off at the end of the war, right? Mm -hmm. Bhishmadev is lying there on his bed of arrows, and that's kind of where Bhagavatam continues, right? And I saw, you know, those kind of aha moments for me were a big motivator to start reading more. Yeah. And then one of the devotees in my life uh, shared with me the Bhagavad Gita audiobook by Javita Prabhu, the full narration with purports. And he said that's really helped him because he doesn't have so much time to sit and read, or maybe it's difficult for him. It was, you know, he is not a native English speaker. But he said he really found it helpful to listen to the audiobook. And so he gave me a copy, and I just started playing it on repeat. You know, every morning, my morning routine as I'm getting ready, and after a while, I just got hooked. I got addicted. I just kept kept listening, right? So I was like on my 15th iteration of, of listening to the Bhagavad Gita audiobook. And every time you listen to the same purports that are sounding a little bit familiar, you get new nuances and you pick up on new things and like, wow. So, you know, to really have those experiences with the books that bring them to life, that make them relevant, like you were saying, Malini, you know, you laughed, you cried, etc. You know, so 
to get our, our young people to have those experiences. Yeah. Right. Mm. It makes all it makes all the difference, in my opinion, when you have that personal experience of like stepping into that world. Um, I feel like it affects all the areas of your spiritual life because it feels real. It's an experience. It's not just something theoretical, but it's actually tangible. You feel like this is actually something real. And um, and then I feel like it changes everything. As soon as you have one of those experiences, for me, I went from uh, reading basically nothing or really struggling, and then I would read like eight cantos in a year or something like that because that it it had clicked that okay this door has opened and I do think also that's another topic of that Krishna being merciful enough he has to open that door for you also a little bit so when the timing is right and if you're 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 really trying I feel like Krishna sees that and then um, I feel like it's it's again it's a personal process Krishna is doing with us this with us hand in hand so but yeah. I, yeah I, on the topic of challenges, before we move on to the next point, I just wanted to mention, lately I've been reflecting on trying to figure out how to reach the youth who don't come to our Bhagavad Gita study group. You know, we have 20, 30 youth who come regularly, and then there's 40, 50 youth in our community who never come. So that's a challenge for me as a, as a you know, trying to, you know, inspire the youth. How to reach those youth who don't come. You know, how to make friends with them and build a relationship to the point where they feel comfortable coming. Mm. Maybe will they, they will come now after the video. Let's see. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Just one other thing we, we could try, which, I, which has worked well, is that when we turn it around and instead of uh, youth coming just to hear Prabhupada's books, what we do is we tell them to go away, read it, and then come back and present it. And then and they have to be the ones who kind of mm -hmm. explain it to everyone else and have to be ready for those questions. Then it immediately it puts them in a different frame of mind. Um, and they, they begin to think quite creatively as well and begin to kind of go forward and think like, how, how would someone else take this? And how would I answer this? And it just creates a whole nother kind of stream of thinking and so that that's been quite interesting as well um, to to ask them to present stuff. And, hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, I think s studying and reading is all also about transformation, right? It it should actually it's not just an intellectual exercise, but it should build our characters. It should really bring transformation. So maybe we could look a little bit at. Um, I mean, we spoke about challenges. What about success stories, or maybe maybe you you all have some experiences or some example of of how some of the devotees under your care kind of really changed a lot, or um, you know, or maybe you, I mean, either yourself or some of the devotees you're working with. Someone likes to share some examples of how the study of Prabhupada's books really changed the lives of some devotees or made a difference in their lives. I think I, I did have like one very interesting experience with someone who was kind of very, um, didn't read much, um, quite shy, um, not really like a, a, a preacher or a kind of social um, person, but we started reading Prabhupada's books with him and uh, he began to feel like so many of his questions were answered and he felt as though it was giving him purpose it was giving him confidence um and it was just giving him clarity in his life and it was quite interesting because he became so inspired that um he became a book distributor and and i didn't have that 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 was quite a unique experience for me because generally we kind of distribute books as as you know just something you know that we know is powerful and will help people and but we almost have to force ourselves a little bit so many of us myself definitely um but it was so beautiful to see someone who had actually actually become inspired by Prabhupada's books and <clears throat> just felt as though it had helped him so much that he just felt like he just naturally wanted to give that and and 
So that was quite quite an inspiring. And you know, like Manaram Prabhu was talking about Vaishai Shikabru, and he just talks about, you know, like as much of a Sankirtan general as Vaishai Shikabru is, you can see he's just so much also like the sadhana and the kind of diving deep in spiritual life. And and you see how those two things really work together. Mm. Um so for me, just to see someone who's very shy, very like not a, not necessarily a preacher, become so inspired that he almost came out of that identity because it was so valuable to him um, what what he was giving to others. So that was nice. That's po powerful. If someone you know realizes the great wealth in Shri Prabhupada's book so much so that he actually wants to share it with others, that's yeah, that's a beautiful example. I'm going to start with Malini to break the uh, the, the order here. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Manoram. Um, well, like I said, with the, with my group, we're still doing the introduction course, so I feel like the big transformational stories have yet to come. But I do have one little anecdote on this um, on this topic uh, that uh, we were we were reading. Um, the it was from Bhagavad Gita. It was eight twenty eight. Um, about um, devotional service. It was a verse about devotional service and how you can go through all these stages of life and become a brahmachari and read scriptures and perform sacrifices, but if you just do devotional service, it doesn't mean that you are bereft of all the benefits of doing all those other things. So, and it was quite a long purport, and I want and I wanted us to read that verse so that the youth could feel inspired that it doesn't have to be so difficult. Devotional service is a straightforward process from the heart. Um, but it was it was it was a bit of a long purport, and it was hard for it was hard for them to let it sink in. And so, I we kind of went into this analogy of that for mountain climbing that if um, if you're mountain climbing, uh, you can do it unsupported or supported. So when you're doing it supported, you have all these safety things and you go slow, but you have the safety. So if you fall, that it catches you. So it's slower, but you're climbing to the top. But if you're unsupported, you can climb very fast, but you run the risk of falling if you get pushed by the wind or something. So doing devotional service, just not reading the scriptures or anything, it can work, but you're climbing in a kind of unsupported way you're going you're going you're going straight for the top you want to reach it you know which is really nice obviously but um like this thing of just if you if you just like kirtan or anything which is again it's a beautiful thing and it should be encouraged but then when something happens in your life and you're like i don't understand why the world works this way i don't i don't get it um then it's really helpful to have those safety things going up so I kind of explained it to them in that way that reading the scriptures and doing all these things, these practices, having sadhana bhakti, it can feel like it's slow and a bit tedious sometimes, but you're doing it steady and you're going to make it to the top eventually. And then kind of a light bulb went off in their eyes and they're like, oh, that makes so much sense. <laughs> and it's those moments that I really, I live for when we read together is that when we can talk about it and discuss it in a way that they are that it does make sense to them and they feel like, okay, now, now I get it. Um, so that's not a big transformational story, but it's those small moments, which I feel are also important. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. I, I was actually going to mention that to find success, you know, yes, we have the, you know, the Manushya Nam Sahasri Shu, there's one in a million, right? Who, who like really takes it seriously and, and shines. And, you know, mm -hmm. I can think of an example. I'm not going to mention his name, but, you know, he was a really shy kid, was really into playing sports and basketball, started coming to our youth groups, got inspired somehow by the association, the Sangha and the readings and whatever. And now he's giving Bhagavatam class at our temple. So yes, you know, we have shining examples of, of youth who graduated from the program and they really got inspired. 
But, you know, back to, you know, how do you define success? I, I see success in much smaller steps, like Malini was saying. During our reading group, when you have kids who don't normally participate in the discussion and all of a sudden they get excited and something clicks, right? And they start participating and they start getting excited about, about the topic. Or at the end of our reading, we ask for, um, for everyone to share their takeaway. You know, what did you get out of the discussion? And we go around the room and everyone has to share or gets to share. And to see it reflected in the students, right? So you've tried as a teacher, or as a presenter to really convey something and then they're reflecting it back to you and you can see, okay, they got it, right? So to me, that's success, right? It's not just, oh, you know, anyway. Back to this point that I, I want to make it relevant for all the young people in our community, not just for the 10% or less that are really philosophically inclined. You know, so what is success? You know, even if they appreciate little aspects of it, if they keep coming to the Bhagavad Gita study group, you, you know, month after month, year after year, that's success. Mm. Thank you. Maybe we can look into the future a little bit. What um, what could be future aspirations or goals for ISKCON in terms of youth engagement with Prabhupada's books? I don't know, in the sense of what would you like to see in ISKCON to, to be developed or uh, what could be done better in the future to encourage youth? Maybe you have just some some vision or some ideas or, or some desire how things should be. Any thoughts on, on that? I think one thing for me was really inspiring was when one of our youth um, from here, well, he was originally from America, and then he went back to Alachua, and um, and he just kind of showed up and gave Bhagavatam class, you know? And it was like, it was almost like he was... Uh, I guess not the first, but like not many of that generation were kind of really coming out and 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 speaking. And when he came out, I think it really came out and gave a gave a class. I think it really it spoke volumes, you know, um, just for other youth to hear another young person speaking their realizations about Prabhupada's books, and just to show them that yeah, they can do this and. And that's what I try wherever I go to encourage um, the youth to just express their realizations and to discuss. So I think, yeah, giving them more opportunities to also um, share what they're reading. And um, I think that's really it's inspirational. Yeah, yeah our, our temple president is very much inclined to work with our youth. So they encourage our young people to give Bhagavatam classes and Sunday feast lectures, you know, so then that forces them to really study and look into it and like, whoa, I have to present. And Vaisheshi Prabhu also mentioned that at uh, Iskon Silicon Valley, he encourages his youth to research a particular topic and then give a five or 10 minute presentation to the community about it, you know, and that forces them to really delve deep and, and research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I remember being at ISV and um, it was a packed temple room and one of the, the young girls, she gave a presentation on something for 10 minutes. And it was, I mean, it was, it was incredible, you know, like, and, and then the encouragement and then the feeling that, yes, I shared something and it was appreciated by the devotees. It gives you so much more confidence. And so, yeah, I think definitely opening up those opportunities are um, amazing. Yeah. On the topic of wishful thinking for the future, audiobooks, Robert's books read in audiobook format by young people to inspire other young people. <laughs> right? It's, I mean, I love Amala Bhakta Swami, but, uh, you know, some of our young people connect with other young people who are inspired. And so, you know, yeah. on that, in that vein. Audiobooks are, are something that's really hot and not explored enough. And many of our young people, they listen to audiobooks for work or for whatever, you know, when they're commuting back and forth from school. So, you know, devotional audiobooks, show Prabhupada's books in audiobook format, read in an enthusiastic way by other people they can relate to. 
one of our youth said he was very inspired by a lecture that Keshav Swami gave. <laughs> and Bhuta Bhavana Prabhu also. So having people like that who give enthusiastic classes to inspire the youth. Malini, what would you like to see happen in the future in this regard? Manifest. I would also love audiobooks to uh, be a, become a bigger thing. I also know um, there are some in my group that are, they're dyslexic also. They just find it hard to read on just a really basic level. Um, and it's easier for them to engage in, in audiobooks. I know for one of one of my friends, she um, she really struggles to read, but she was listening to um, Brinda's uh, Ramayan, this um, Shadow of the Sun Dynasty and the trilogy. And she flew through it. She really, because again, she it became alive for her. She was in that world and it was um, engaging for her in that sense. So that would be nice. I think for me and the group I'm working with is that I would really, I would really love for them to build stability in their spiritual practice, in their relationship with Krishna. And that also the sense of confidence and empowerment, but in a good way that they can come to the temple and if someone quotes a verse, they've heard it before, or that if the space is open to do to Asi Puja, that they know how to do it. And, um, to have this spiritual knowledge and consistency and their service and to have these building blocks on the way home to Krishna that it's um, and that they can feel kind of grounded within themselves in this world that they have something to believe in and that they and that they don't believe in it in a in a superficial way just because everybody else does it's our culture that's what we do but that it's true and that it's deep um, because then they can give that to others. And then they can share it. It's a ripple effect. It spreads that way. So for something really substantial and deep to run in them as they move forward in life, that that's my that's my goal, and my mm. hope, really. Yes. Yeah, I hear here like also empowerment, like to empower the youth to actually take these steps and I'm encouraging them. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I think we are slowly coming to an end of the conversation uh, but I, I would like to hear from everyone maybe just some final thoughts or some uh, what message would you like to convey to the youth especially those who are maybe exploring more the study of Prabhupada's books any final words please I can begin <laughs> There's something I'm quite passionate about um, for young people, um, which which I kind of did in my life and and, and took me in a different direction, um, which was when I was kind of 21, then I went to India for six months and I just absorbed myself um, in study. Uh, not just study, uh, other things, but ashram life, basically, and study was a big part of that. And uh, I just encourage all young people to, before they get into their life, um, before they get into all the responsibilities and everything, you know, that they want to achieve, all the beautiful things that they're going to do, um, to just take six months out. Um, I'm a strong believer in that everyone should do that. And um, and a big part of those six months should just be time spent with Srila Prabhupada's books because, yeah, there's something when you read a little bit every day or a little bit every week, and, and that's definitely beautiful. But there's something when you study every day with with others and you just get you just kind of get to a certain point where you make that connection and then you and then you can just be so yeah, I, I believe every single young person should take six months um, to explore the world of Krishna consciousness and Prabhupada's books. It will be, that would be amazing if we could get to a point where every single young person did that in our movement. And yeah, just thanks to also Manaram um, for all his initiatives. I was just with the Euro bus tour and it's amazing to just see all these like, yeah, amazing, full of life and, 
Um, so I know yeah, devotees have been doing that in Sweden. I know um, Malini and the whole crew, they're such an inspired bunch, you know. So, yeah, I really feel hopeful. But, yeah, those six months, I think, would be amazing. Please excuse me if I pick up on that point. <laughs> I 100% agree. You know, we've come to the realization in, in recent years that we call it the Krishna conscious gap year, and we're trying to encourage our young people to take a year off. Because usually if you're taking six months off with school, you know, they're like, oh, well, you know, might as well take the whole year off. Because um, it's hard, you know, when you're in school. And in North America, they have this concept at university that they actually defer your acceptance and they, the larger universities encourage young people to take a gap year, figure out what they want to do in life and then come back and commit to a four year course of study. Because apparently it makes the university look bad if you change your major halfway through and take longer to complete your courses, you know, six years instead of four years or whatever. So it's actually quite interesting, you know, that the universities in our part of the world encourage gap years. And so we've kind of picked up on that and we've seen what um, Kesho Swami and others have done at the manor with their six month sabbaticals. And we're really encouraging our young people to t consider taking a year off, spend a Krishna conscious gap year, living the life of a devotee, right? Experiencing ashram life, move into a temple, move to Switzerland, stay there for a little while, right? <laughs> we had Ramai from Sweden live in the ashram at the Zurich temple for a little bit. Explore temple life, explore Christian consciousness, dive deep into it, because yes, you know, give a year of your life because the rest of your life is there for family life and business and all of the obligations that we have. And wouldn't that be wonderful also for all of our temples to be populated all of a sudden with all these amazing young people who are taking a gap year, you know, giving their energy and enthusiasm to the movement. Um, so that's the idea. I, I wholly support it. I wish we could do more of that. It's a cultural shift. It's a paradigm shift. You know, a lot of times I find that the problem are not the young people. It's the parents. They're like, no way. You're not going to go and live as a brahmachari in the temple for a year. <laughs> You're never going to come back. You need to st keep on, you know, do summer school and internships and, and uh, you know, become a medical doctor. But yeah, the gap year. And uh, and I was going to say, it's you know, you can't just look at encouraging young people to study the books in isolation. It's a lifestyle. Christian consciousness is a lifestyle. And so the bus tours try to give them an immersion experience for one month, you know, just, uh, just power-packed immersion experience in Christian consciousness. Um, or a sabbatical, living in the ashram, you know, having the company and association of devotees and living in that kind of environment. The, the morning sadhana, the morning program, you know, it, it's all conducive, right? It's not just, oh, you know, you take a kid who's in high school and they come once a week to Bhagavad Gita study and they get a little bit of philosophy. You know, that's nice, but, you know, really dive deep into it and really absorb yourself and take that opportunity while you're young, while you still have the time. Yeah, that's my hope and wish for the future for our young people. And for older devotees to become a little bit more understanding and kind and compassionate. And a little bit less in the mood of Shua Prabhupada said, therefore you must, because that guilt trip doesn't work with the third or fourth generation, at least not in my experience. And I know that seems to be the motivating factor for a lot of the older devotees. Well, Shua Prabhupada said, and therefore we do this, and therefore we must. Yeah, you know, at our young youth Bhagavad Gita study group, we have to, there's a couple layers to unpack that. We can't just use that guilt. It's like, okay, you know, why did Shil Prabhupada say this? And why is it important? And why, you know. Anyway. We, we, <laughs> there, in trying to create a, a youth-friendly environment at temples, and Krishna Prema Rupa Prabhu, you know, because we discussed this about doing, you know, sabbaticals or Krishna conscious gap years at the Zurich temple. The temple president has to be on board. There has to be a certain mood that's encouraging for the young people, right? Not just that you never talk to them and you just expect him to, you know, do all of their service. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, there is, there's some mentorship there. And so we need to create a system of, of mentors who are um, in tune with and able to inspire those young people. Mm -hmm.
Molini, you have the last word. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's really nice to hear all of you talk about um, talk about this and the different perspectives as well. And I totally agree with the gap here that it's it's really it's a different experience when you immerse yourself fully, and that's your just a, because sometimes, with, especially with second generation, you have a devotee life and you have a normal life, kind of, and you split. So, yeah. and sometimes when you're a full devotee, it's interesting. But actually, the goal is to merge them together as much as possible. But just to offer a different perspective, I would like to speak on behalf of those who feel that they either can't or they don't have the opportunity to take the gap year or to do a full immersion. So I just want to speak for that um, uh, margin and um, to really and to feel because a lot of people struggle with time also finding time. They're so busy with school, everything. And so for, for those people, I would really encourage them to start small and be kind to yourself. Again, don't approach it from a point of view of guilt, but rather inspiration and curiosity more than anything else. What What is there to be discovered here? And uh, I'd also like to end with a quote from one of my favorite people on this planet, uh, Manjali Devidasi, who is a Prabhupada disciple. And I remember when I was in the ashram at the manor, she came and she spoke to us girls one day and, and she told us, remember, we are training to play with Krishna, not to become dry philosophers. <laughs> and I really loved that because it really put the whole thing into perspective of, um, and also Krishna says in the Gita, you cannot understand this knowledge with your intellect, it, it happens with the heart. So, yeah, so remembering that we're, that where we're actually going, what we're learning to do. And then I feel like that also gives an impetus to then put in the real work. And no, I want to build this structure properly. I want to pave this road properly home, you know? And, and, and books are the basis of this whole process. It is the library of our whole existence. And I feel like opening a cover is like opening a door to Krishna. And it really is like that. I mean, in the right mindset, you just open it and he's right there. So, and it's not boring. I promise to, if there's, if there will be any youth listening to this, I promise it's not boring. Just, just try a different angle, a different perspective and, and everything will be great. Thank you so much, all of you for joining us. I hope we did uh, got, I mean, I'm quite sure we turned a lot of wonderful insights, hopefully for the youth, but also for other listeners, as we heard, it's not only the youth, but also the other devotees, senior devotees, that they become more un understandable what it requires to encourage the youth. So I hope with this conversation we helped in that way. And yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. Krishna. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 R